Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, welcome back my dear friends, a uh, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to you all at whatever time you are seeing these lectures. This is the second lecture under investment management and portfolio management under the Swam Prabha lecture series and my good name is Raghunandan Sangupta from the IME department at IIT Kanpur. So, if you uh, definitely have seen the first lecture, it was basically the initial part was the detailed description about different topics which I would co consider and cover under the 30 lecture series uh, for this course investment analysis and portfolio management and each uh, lecture as you know is for one hour. So, in the second uh, lecture under the series uh, we will consider the financial markets and a little bit more detail. Uh, so, the first part was about very simple concepts of microeconomic concepts of demand supply and price elasticity, the concept of utility, risk and so on and so forth. Now, we will go into a little bit more detailed description about financial market. Obviously, financial markets is a huge topic. Uh, it is just a uh, initial descriptions would be given for this uh, course. We will just discuss few important concepts, few important definitions and what we mean by financial markets. Obviously, I have gone through that in the first lecture, I will just elaborate on them. Who are the players? What are the characteristics of the players? And then go into different type of, of simple actual practical information which I, which I have collected and I will try to show it to you. But obviously, the techniques how you find out and solve this will be more in the later part of this course when we go into investment analysis, portfolio theory and then come into options, futures, swaps and so on and so forth. The lecture uh, main important points under lecture 2 would be, would we consider the capital market, the commodities market, what we mean by them, um, what we is the money market. Uh, what is the definition of that, what we mean by derivative of a financial product. So, obviously, derivative can be for the financial product, can be for a, for different type of characteristics of the financial product, it can be based on interest rate, it can be based on humidity, rainfall, so on and so forth. We will consider what we mean by future market and how future markets can be utilized in order to basically ensure the price fluctuations do not go positive or neg negative depending on whether somebody wants to uh, buy or sell a product or, uh, or wants to basically lock on to the price and not uh, make a huge loss or lock on the profit. We will consider the commodity market of products as I mentioned about uh, grains, wheat, uh, maize, log, timber, different life products. We will also consider other markets which pertain to financial markets. Financial markets I am considering as a whole in a very much more bigger in scope for, for our discussion in this course. We will uh, define few interesting terms here and what we mean by efficient markets in a very simple sense and then as I said few of the interesting data which we see day to day will also be illustrated using different above graphs, histograms, line charts and so on and so forth. Now, the capital markets are basically long term debt or equity backed securities are sold and bought in the uh, capital markets. So, we have different definitions of capital markets, different examples of capital markets. So, I am just giving you few, few examples here in order to motivate and, and bring up the interest in this course. We have according to total amount of 
valuations of traded in, in trillions of US dollars. You have the New York Stock Exchange and this links which you see uh, when you are um, listening to these lectures and uh, the video lectures, you can definitely note down these links and click on them or go to Google and click on them and go into depths of understanding what are the characteristics of these different type of capital markets, what financial products are traded, what is the total valuation, what are the different norms, assumptions, what are the different type of government uh, rules and regulations which pertain to different countries. You have the New York Stock Exchange which has about 24.19 trillion of US uh, dollars of total uh, market capitalization for that. You have the NASDAQ which has a value of about 18.59. You have the Shanghai Stock Exchange which comes to about, so I have, I have written down in the, in the value wise from the highest to the lowest. So, the third one which I was mentioning in, in is in Asia which is the Shanghai Stock Exchange which has a valuation about rough valuation of 6.87. The Euronext uh, which basically trades in different type of, of um, stocks in the European zone which has a value of, of 5.69. Japanese exchange has a valuation of about 5.29, Shenzhen stock exchange again in China has a valuation about 4.90, Hong Kong stock exchange is in Asia, I am just mentioning the continent where they operate, valuation of 4.53, we have the national stock exchange in India, NSC and obviously in India you have the BSC also, national stock exchange has a valuation about 3.49 total value traded. You have the Saudi stock exchange of value of 3.04, you have the um, London stock exchange or the London stock exchange group which has a, a value of 2.96 and the TMX group in Canada has about 2.86. There are others also there, you have the, the Nikkei which, which is an index traded in Japanese, you have the CAC, DAX. You have the Australian one, you have the Singaporean one stock exchange. So, all these things ha, do come under the capital markets where the demand and supply depending on, on the trading of the financial securities are done and based on which ideas of demand and supply would give you as I mentioned in the first lecture about the price and based on the price we do the different type of studies of investment analysis which will follow up in, in, in the subsequent lectures starting from 3rd to the 30th one. For the commodities market where you trade in different type of commodities which I mentioned uh, about different type of uh, agricultural products, different type of life products. Um, then different type of uh, commodities like log, iron ore, zinc, um, then copper. So, the trading markets for the commodities are Chicago Board of Trade which is the biggest, then you have the New York Mercantile Exchange, then comes the commodities exchange COMEX, then you have the London Metal Exchange which is a big one, then you have the term Tokyo Commodity Exchange, in India you have the Multi Commodity Exchange, the National Commodities and Derivatives Exchange and the Indian Commodity Exchange. So, the last three are specific to India. So, I thought trying to give you the examples of both the financial markets as well as the commodities both for the interna international arena as well as in India would definitely give you some idea. If you go through them both through the exchanges, their URL as well as do a good study and good uh, analysis and, and reading once you get the information about this, this exchanges. Now, what is the functioning of the money market? So, money market where, where it is we will consider is the most fluid. It basically helps in financing uh, the trade and commerce. So, People are willing to buy and sell products, people are willing to exchange goods, exchange financial securities. So, it helps and facilitates a good market or a place where different type of lenders and borrowers are there who would like to trade on this um, 
this different type of instruments in order to ensure that there is a good flow of, of money in, in the overall financial markets. It helps in financing industrial investment and growth because for any investment as I said you would need any big investments trying to build up a factory, try to bring up a, a manufacturing plant you need a lot of investments. So, that rather than trying to build uh, utilize your own money you can definitely go and, and split up or, or break up the overall risk because for any big investment there is a lot of risk it can be economic risk it can be political risk, it can be whether there is a particular demand and supply is there, whether there is a technology can change which will make that particular technology which you are trying to build up by building the factory may become obsolete. So, based on, on the risk analysis, so the, the industry can invest for the growth of the economy in the money market. It facilitates profitability of the investment which somebody is doing. So, obviously, when you are trying to invest you want to earn money and then distribute the profit amongst the people who have lent you money. If it is not your money obviously, you have, you have taken a loan. So, you need to return the loan, but at the same time try to make a profit for your all overall investment, overall all, all efforts we are trying to put in to run the, the business, run the industry. It helps the commercial establishment to be self sufficient in their operations. Um, because uh, rather than have their own money they basically borrow money from the people who want to put in a deposit and then lend it to people who want to run a business, uh, who want to take a loan and uh, it becomes basically makes the overall market much more fluid, more demand, more supply means, means there is huge amount of exchange of money is taking place. It facilitates the functioning of the central bank. In India, you have the RBI. In different countries, you have the central bank. It basically has some rules and regulation based on which the overall functioning of the money market happens. So, it also gives a overall environment where the central bank's rules and regulations are followed depending on how fluid the market is. Who are the players in the money market? So, they can be retails and institutional money. Uh, market funds can be there, they are banks. So, banks can be RBI, SBI, Indusind Bank, Axis Bank, ICIC Bank, so on and so forth. There are different type of central banks, merchant banks, they can be cooperative banks who want to operate in the market such that everybody gets uh, are able to distribute the, the overall money in a much more broader sense throughout the society throughout the economy such that the overall commerce, overall trade, overall investment progresses in the positive way. As I said you have the derivative market, so it is a market for derived products based on financial instruments, stocks, then it can be based on different type of bonds, different type of uh, investment which the company has done. They can be future contracts, they can be options options can be put and call, they can be options to buy and sell which are basically derived from different assets. Assets I do not mean only financial assets can be actual products also. So, different type of, of derivative markets can be based on buying and selling of log, buying and selling of maize, buying and selling of say for example, copper, buying and selling of say for example, petroleum. So, these are all the different type of products you want to buy and sell either in some time in future or now. So, if it is future you want to basically you means the investor who wants to do wants to en ensure that the price fluctuations are not too positive or no too negative that means, not on the higher side or the lower side because you want to lock on your profit or do not do not want to make a huge amount of loss. So, if I want to buy and if the actual price increases in a huge amount obviously, I have to buy at a very high price. So, that means, I may incur a loss. If I want to sell and the price suddenly decreases then I am forced to sell at a very low price again a huge amount of loss. So, I want to basically lock it at a value such that the price fluctuations are not too high on the positive or negative side. 
The market for the derivatives can be exchange traded where there is a exchange people buyer and seller come and go into the transactions different type of financial transactions and another can be over the counter which is very specific to two buyers and sellers. So, obviously buyers and sellers are, are there for this very specific type of contracts, but there is not much of a demand and supply of those type of products. Uh, from other parties. So, obviously, if a buy and seller very specific to a specific contract is there, we will see later on. Then, uh, if there is no amount of confusion between the two parties, there is no risk. So, obviously, they, these two buyers and sellers can go into a contract based on the over the counter uh, concept. But later on, we will see that generally we need an intermediary a financial institution in between such that the financial institution is able to regulate the overall risk which is taking place between two parties. Minimize the amount of loss if say for example, some one party defaults. So, we will consider that later on with the concept of over the counter contracts. Now, who are the players in the derivative market? So, there are basically four players and each have their own specific ideas why they want to operate. So, one is the hedger, the second one is the speculator, the third one is the margin traders and the fourth one is the arbitrage. So, who wants to basically operate in these four different types of, of, of uh, definitions based on which they operate. The hedger wants to offset potential losses or gains that may be incurred by a company in investment. So, we say for example, which I said the price is increasing or decreasing. So, increase may be a loss or a prof or a gain, decrease may be a loss or a gain. So, the hedger wants to basically lock in at a such a value that he or she does not incur a huge amount of, of profit or, or a loss. So, he wants to basically play it in, in a in so called safe zone such that the profit is there, but not too much loss is there, not too much profit is there. A speculator wants to speculate. So, wants to make a profit uh, by with the hope that the financial deal becomes more valuable in the new future. So, he wants to make an extra profit rather than trying to consume the product the want play player wants to basically um, make a deal such that due to the fluctuation in the price of an increase or decrease he or she makes an extra amount of profit. Margin traders borrows money from the broker to purchase stock. Um, based on what his overall idea is for the investment. That means, he wants to diversify, increase the return, decrease the risk and obviously, depending on the transaction, the money has to be returned by the margin traders. Arbitrage uh, wants to capitalize on the advantage based on difference in pricing in two or more mar different markets. So, market 1, market 2, there is a difference, but nowadays with instantaneous information flowing uh, throughout the world it may, may become very difficult, but considering there is a difference in the prices and that combination of, of this buying and selling uh, through that um, operation the arbitrator is able to make some amount of profit by matching the deals by selling and buying. So, obviously, that consumption factor is also not coming into the picture for the arbitrage. Now, future markets and commodity markets if we go to the definitions, future markets is basically the market for, uh, for a derivative contract agreement to buy or sell a specific commodity asset or a security at a set future date at a set price. So, say for example, uh, I am an investor who is drilling uh, for oil and I know that oil prices uh, will increase. So, obviously, I am very happy if the oil prices increases because I sell it at a higher price, but what happens if the suddenly the oil prices decreases after 2 months when I really tap the oil. So, I want to basically go into such a contract in the future market such that the overall price fluctuation is not in the neg negative direction because by that I am able to sell my product at a stipulated price. So, I can go that uh, for that example which I get. In case if I want to buy, so obviously I want to buy at, at the lowest price, but if I think the prices are increasing, so I want to basically go into the futures market by locking in at a price such that I buy at, at that particular price. Any decrease in price 
obviously I do not pay for that, but obviously you have to also consider they can be uh, other side of the picture also where if the price increases, if I have gone into a contract technically I would basically uh, uh, buy at that price because I, I need to buy at a, at a certain price and immediately if I am able to send at a higher price depending on the price is very high, then theoretically I am able to make a profit, but the overall motivation is that I want to lock in both the increase and decrease of the prices. Commodities market is where buying and selling or trading of raw products such as oil, gold, coffee, log, any livestocks are done. Commodities can generally be for natural resources and livestock and agricultural products also like maize, barley, cotton, grain and so on and so forth. Other markets are financial service markets, depository markets and non-depository markets. Financial markets are where people trade financial securities and derivatives like mutual fund, pension funds, insurance companies are there, financial adversary companies are there, commercial banks are there. In the depository markets, market is there for organizations, banks, institutions that hold securities and assist in trading of securities, can be banks, financial institutions, where they facilitate the trading. Non-depository markets are markets for intermediaries which obtain funds and then pass on them off to somewhere else like credit unions, retail banks, where trying to basically take as a deposit deposits and do the business is not under the purview of non-depository market players. Other markets to continue can be foreign exchange, where the markets are there for different selling and buying of different currencies, maybe euros to Indian rupees, dirhams, yen, dollars, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, whatever it is. In cryptocurrency markets which trade in digital currency and we are seeing that that cryptocurrency is increasing in its overall um, foothold in the market. So market which trades in, let me continue reading it, market which trades in digital currencies and allows customers to trade cryptocurrencies or digital currencies for other assets such as conventional money. So there are different type of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Zcash, Stellar, Lumen, Chainlink and so on and so forth. So nowadays obviously even though this point which I am going to make may not definitely be relevant for this course, but we do hear about the concept of blockchain and which is coming in a very big way where different development of blockchains are happening in order to take care of the security aspect about the database aspect and how the transactions can be done between individuals without any intermediaries or a bank being there in the position. But obviously security is one of the main important factor when you design or build up the blockchain in the consensual way that how the transaction will take place without any hitch, without any, 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 any um, encryption being broken or without any tampering in the overall process as the transaction happens between parties or between two parties. The spot market is basically where the actual cash market is there, where financial instruments or commodities are sold instantaneously for immediate delivery. So as of now, demand and supply is there, somebody wants to sell, somebody wants to buy and what is the price? So that overall trading where it is done for immediate utilization or immediate delivery of that product is basically where the spot market is. That depends on the exact demand and supply of that particular product, of that particular commodity, of that particular financial instrument. There is another market which is basically the interbank lending market where individuals are not there. So markets where banks lend funds, lend monies to each other for a specified time and a specified quantity. So important terms under which comes under the interbank lending market can be repo rate, can be overnight rate and depending on the demand and supply what SBI lending to say for example XYZ bank or XYZ bank lending to SBI on a particular amount, particular time. So they would interest rates would be decided upon the demand and supply, how high the demand is, how low the demand is and this interest rate also fluctuate. So interest rate which I would be mentioning time and again 
are one of the important driving factors based on which the price will increase and decrease and accordingly. Now, continuing uh, this discussion about financial markets, here are a few definitions. Obviously, they are not all in totality and they would be considered later on in the course, but anybody interested can definitely pick up any good book to understand what these actually important concepts or the ideas of the players mean. A broker acts as an what is a broker? A broker acts as an agent for an investor and is compensated by a commission. So, I take your money, invest, so I am the broker and obviously depending on the trading and how the profit is, I obviously have as per the contract some commission which is paid to that particular person who is the broker. A brokerage firm is basically a firm under which different brokers operate. They concentrate on the transactions of buying and selling and obviously, there is a rules and regulations and depending on how big the firm is, how big the broker is or how small the broker is, the commissions would be decided depending on the brokerage firm, the experience of the broker, who is the individual who wants to invest the money and so on and so forth. Market orders are when one buy or buys or sells a stated number of shares immediately depending on the market. So, I have said that yes, buy 10 number of Tata uh, uh, motors or sell 12 numbers of Tata steel. So, depending on, on whatever instructions have been given by the investor, uh, the individual and the broker acts accordingly. Limit order basically means uh, the broker buys or sells and executes that operation only at a particular price of the share. So, maybe I said that if the price of Tata steel falls below 1200 rupees do not sell or if the price of say for example, Tata Motors or Reliance or ITC say for example, it go, goes above um, uh, 2000 rupees do not buy. So, these are the limit orders based on which the brokers would operate. So, I am just giving you examples there can be different type of, of limit orders depending on different type of concepts and different um, uh, instructions can be given to the broker based on which he or she operates. Short sell is a concept which will be coming time and again later on. So, we I, I will go into the details of short selling as, as I mentioned when the portfolio analysis is done, when the investment analysis from the optimization point of view is done, we will consider that, but just I will I will briefly touch upon that is the concept when one borrows stock certificates for use in initial trade actually which I do not have and I, I once the transaction is over. I return back that particular stock to the person from whom I have borrowed. So, basically it is a it is a, it's a so called stop gap arrangement or a, a short term arrangement based on which I have uh, with me some stocks if, if I am trying to invest which actually do not belong to me, but I want to basically put them in my portfolio in order to ensure that the idea of trying to basically maximize my profit, minimize my risk or different combination can be ensured. But obviously, once the transaction is over, I have to return back that actual amount of, of um, stocks or financial scripts which I have borrowed in order to, to uh, even out my position. But obviously, as when I even out, depending on the demand and supply of that particular stock, the price will fluctuate. So, obviously, I have to, t the I means the person who has borrowed or uh, gone into the short selling concept has to basically settle that, that uh, transaction at that particular price based on which the transaction is being closed. So, if the price is increases or decreases based on the fact what it was initially when the portfolio analysis was being made or when the investment analysis was being made, obviously it can happen that the overall transaction may turn out to be a huge amount of profit or may turn out to be a huge amount of loss. So, I am not going to go into the nitty gritties of that, but we will try to analyze how short selling can be considered in the portfolio optimization problem as such. To continue the few def, uh, other definitions, you have the commission broker, the floor brokers and the floor traders. So, commission brokers takes orders placed by customers of the investor. I am going to use the word customer investor interchangeably, so please bear with that. And the commission broker ensures the orders are executed on the exchange depending on the orders place. They get a percentage of the commission that the broker firm gets 
from the customers and investors. So, under the brokerage firm, there are many uh, brokers, and depending on the experience, amount of trade, amount of riskiness, amount of the value of the trading, the commissions would be decided. Floor brokers, they assist the commission brokers when there are too many orders flowing of sell and buy, and their commission is basically decided as part and parcel of the commission broker's commission. So, obviously, if somebody helps, the floor broker is helping, so that he or she gets a commission based on amount of transaction, based on the amount of effort of the work being done, based on the nitty gritty is the detail of the transaction which is being done. So, obviously, the commission has to be paid for the work being done by the floor brokers. Floor traders are trade solely for themselves, they do not come under the purview of the exchange and they basically deal on profit and loss based on what they think is best for their own investment. So, they then do not operate for others. So, the floor brokers, traders basically operate uh, on the concept of trying to build up a portfolio of sell and buy depending on what his or her over overall idea of our portfolio has to be, whether the person wants to extra earn an extra profit, increase the, re the return, decrease the risk, whatever it is. Now, I will uh, go into, obviously, there are different type of exchanges which I did mention, uh, London uh, exchange, then you have the um, Tokyo exchange, NASDAQ, New York stock exchange, Bombay stock exchange, uh, NSC, Hang Seng, uh, in Hong Kong, then you have CAC in France. I am talking about these words are the indices, but they operate in, 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 the, in the market for that particular country. So, those are the, the exchange where they are traded. So, they can be DAX in Germany, you can have in Canada, you can have in Australia, you can have in Saudi Arabia, Dubai. So, leave aside all these things, I am only concentrating on the NSC. The reason being, if you have gone through the, the, the initial part of the discussion, I did mention that as we are going through the level of amount of trading which was being done, so NSC was quite high. So, here NSC, uh, in this slide which you see on 16th number slide, NSC would have uh, this 50 number of, of scripts. And in this slide number 16, you have the company name on the first column, the industry under which that company is in the second column, the symbol which is being used for trading which is there in the third column, and the fourth column is basically the international securities identification number. So, based on if I give the ISIN code, so that will give me uh, that uh, in, in the NSC, what is that particular script which is being traded. So, if you see the industry in the first uh, slide, which is 16 number slide, so you have metal and mining, services are there, healthcare, consumer durables, financial services, automobiles, oil and natural gas, telecommunication, and the different type of companies are Adani's, Apollo, Asian Paints, Axis Bank, Bajaj Auto, Bajaj Finance, Bajaj Financial Service, BPCL. Bharati, Airtel. To continuing, you have again, if I come back to the industry, it can be FMCG, healthcare, automobiles again, construction, in ITs, financial services, and the different companies are. I am just giving the overall view. They are Britannia Industries, CIPLA, Coal India. Then Devi Laboratories, Dr. Reddy's, Aisha, Grassim, HCL, HDFC, both bank and life insurance. In the third slide, which is slide number 18, again the different type of industries are more or less the same, financial services, FMCG, automobiles, and the companies are Hito, Hero Motocop, Hindalco, HUL, HDFC, ICICI Bank. ITC, Indusind Bank, Infosys, JSW Steel, Kotak Mahindra. Then under the other the later part here, LNT, I am talking about the company's name, LNT, Mahindra Mahindra, M and M, uh, Maruti Suzuki, NTPC, Nestle, ONGC, Power Grid, Reliance, SBI, Life Insurance as well as SBI Bank. 
and the Indian industries as usual are construction, automobile, FMCG, power and gas, financial services. I am just reading the main points in these slides, it is to make you just more acquainted with the indices for the NSC. Obviously, you can have a look at BSC, NASDAQ, FTSE, Nikkei, Hansing, so on and so forth. So, you will get an idea and obviously, these uh, scripts which make up the market index are not stagnant, they keep changing depending on, on the on how frequently they are traded. So, each country has their own uh, way of trying to find out the capitalization and based on which the, the scripts or the composition of the index changes. And in the, la, in the last slide, we have this again the industries are more or less the same, you have the companies are Sun uh, Pharmaceuticals. TCS, Tata Consumer, Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Tech Mahindra, Titan and then Ultratech Siemens. I have not read out all of them, but I am just mentioning them accordingly. And if you see, for each of the slides, I did not mention about the symbol and the ISIN code. So, the symbols are based on what you check in the NSE side and ISIN code will give you an idea that in the general sense, if somebody wants to find out somebody is staying in another country, wants to find out what are the different type of scripts in the FMCG goods or the automobile goods, what are being traded, the he or she can find it out from the ISNN code. Now, this slide number 21 gives you the number of trades in NSC starting from 1st January 2015 to 13th, 30th January 2015. So, these, uh, this is the histogram and uh, this histogram shows you that uh, within uh, the month of about 6, if you see, I will just highlight it. So, see for example, the trading is being done quite heavily here, in number of trades. While if you see the number of trades which is being done from 1st to about 1st January to 1st of April, they, there is a fluctuation, but the average value is, is much lower than the average value which you had. I am just drawing these average value arbitrarily. Obviously, one can find out the average values here and find out what is the fluctuations accordingly. By the word fluctuation, I mean, let me come to this. So, if you see the average, uh, if the average here, again I am drawing in the average here. But amount of fluctuation is quite high because due to these, that means the variance is quite high here. The variability is there, but not that much as per the second part, which is basically starting from about middle of a little bit second week of April till end of June. So, this part, which I will uh, highlight, this one which I am highlighting by yellow this part has a high amount of uh, fluctuations. These I am just giving you as a set of information, details will be analyzed later. This part has less amount of fluctuations. So, that would give you that there is a may be a variability, may be price decrease, increase, decrease, may be demand and supply is changing and these are number of trades which is happening for the NSC in total. I am not going into the individual scripts as such. This gives you the proportion change in the quantity in rupees lakhs of NSE between 1st January 2015 to 30th January. So, change between day 1 to day 2, day 2 to day 3. So, if you see and again it is about roughly about uh, half of a year and obviously, there would not be any training on a Saturday, Sunday or a national holiday, but I am ignoring that for the time being. So, if you see here. Uh, with base to the last slide here, 21st one, if you see the proportions of changes which are occurring, here the average value is more or less seems to be same. I am not going to go to the detailed calculation as, of, as such now, but the average seems to be much um, better with respect to the 21st slide. Obviously, there are fluctuations, variability is there. So, if you see here, the variability is, is high here, is high here. So, I will highlight that with, uh, with the highlighter color. So, yellow, 
but the average values seems to be almost the same. Obviously, somebody has to do uh, calculations as I mentioned. By the way, you may be thinking why I have drawn a line graph, technically there are just histograms, because day 1, day 2, day 2, day 3 are, are discrete, so they actually they should be histograms, but in order to just for a better analysis to find out how the line moves, I drew it as a continuous line, but the, but the ideas would definitely be relevant to all of the viewers or the listeners who are listening to this set of lectures. Now, this gives you, I have collected the data from January 1st, 2017 to 31st December 2017, which is for one year, but obviously out of this 365 number of days, each day trading is not there. So, because 15th of January, 15th of August is a holiday in India or 26th of January is a holiday. Similarly, Saturday Sunday is a holiday, maybe other countries would have their holidays accordingly. So, if I consider all those things, obviously it may be possible the number of days of trading for S and P or NASDAQ or DAX or CAC. So, NASDAQ is in US, North American continent, DAX and CAC are in Europe. Nikkei is in, in, in um, Asia, Hang Seng is Hong Kong is in Asia. So, obviously, number of trading is different there when I was calculating, but I have ignored that in order to replicate how the returns look like. Now, this word of returns is coming for the first time and I will discuss it. Obviously, they would be innumerable reference to the concept of returns. Returns as I say rate of return or total return, which I mentioned can be utilized by the symbol uh, uh, rate of return would be small r, total return will be capital R. We will analyze these in details later on, but just for the interest of the viewers, I will just uh, once again uh, bring the relevance of returns here. So, if we see the green line is the fluctuation, I am sorry if it is too cluttered, but if you see the over uh, and and, and uh, these slides um, later on you will find out the fluctuation of S and P which is green in color is much less, while the blue one which is NASDAQ is high. So, obviously, it will give an idea that there is a huge amount of dispersion, huge amount of variability, huge amount of volatility in the NASDAQ indices. So, here the returns I have calculated even though I will, I will mention here. So, consider your uh, investment, even though the word investment will be replaced by the word price, consider the investment at time t 1 is equal to i t sub i t sub x is equal to 1 and investment uh, at time t 2 is equal to i sub x t is equal to 2, then capital R total return will be ca calculated as i t is equal to 2 divided by i t is equal to 1. So, that will give you the return. If I want to find out the small r, it will be i t is equal to 2 minus i t is equal to 1 divided by i t is equal to 1, that will give you the small r. But for stocks, I have not used that and logically so. So, let me erase this one. So, rather than make it too cluttered here. So, generally we will see later on when we come to the areas of interest rate. So, interest rate concept was mentioned in the first lecture about uh, forward rate, um, instantaneous rate, then continuous compounding interest rate, then compounding interest rate, uh, simple interest rate all these things. For generally for the stocks we calculate it like this. So, I which was investment, I am replacing as I mentioned with the price. So, if price 1 is the price of that particular stock and what I mean by price, you will later on see for any general stock, 
there is an opening price, there is a closing price, there is a maximum price, there is a minimum price. So, I have only taken the closing price, because closing price basically has all the informations of all the trade which is taking place for that particular stock throughout the day. So, this P is basically the closing price. So, P 1 is the closing price for day 1 and P 2 is basically the closing price for day 2. Then the return R is calculated by natural logarithmic value of P 2 by P 1. Why so? I will visit it later on, but let me say. So, if I calculate basically here P 2 would be the continuous compounding value of P 1, which is happening for day 1. So, generally if there are t number of days, so obviously P t, here t is now t, uh, the in the sense sorry, uh, my, uh, so I generally want to mention that the suffix which is there, which is 1, 2, 3, 4 basically means the day. So, P t is basically the price for day t would be P 1 e to the power R t, where R is the continuous compounding interest rate. So, generally later on we will see it is denoted by R suffix C, continuous compounding. Based on, on that, generally we, we utilize this continuous compounding values for which the return is calculated by this formula. Now, what we mean by continuous compounding? Let me also highlight it for once. So, generally if it is a timeline and these are the time frames where you invest, take out the money again invest. So, if it is one day, so you invest this money, take it out for day 2 and again reinvest it for day 2. So, these arrows going inside means you are investing and arrows going out from this line means you are taking out the money. Again in the third day you take out the money, again invest, fourth day you take out the money and invest. So, these the differences are one day. So, in case this time frame becomes instantaneous, this one, this delta becomes smaller and smaller, that means I am investing and take out of the money, investing and take out of the money. In that case, in the limiting sense, the value of continuous compounding value comes out to be, which is R c. So, R c continuous compounding interest rate can be found out given the concept of simple interest rate, given the concept of con compounding interest rate, how many number of times of compounding are there, what is the value of the interest rate, whether it is basically given in a quarterly basis or a per annum basis, all things things are, are explained in the later part, but I thought I will make things a little bit more interesting. So, what we are going to find out uh, in actual sense in later part of the program. So, here the this slide which is the returns based on this continuous compounding interest rate, the returns are ln of P 2 by P 1 for 2 days. So, P 2 is basically price of closing price for day 2, P 1 is the closing price for day 1. So, based on that I found out the returns for these indices which are given here. Again I am mentioning S and P 500, NASDAQ, DAX, CAC, Nikkei and Hansen. And if you see here for the values of, of any particular indices which we see, there seems to be a lot of fluctuation here may be a little bit here, but there is stability in this. Stability means at a glance, what I am what I'm trying to find out. So, there is stability here, but obviously somebody has to do the calculation. There is a, there seems to be a stability in the small area, but in the overall big time frame, uh, this is about 365 days technically, but actually number of trading days for any country would be in, in around average value, plus minus it is possible it will be about 240 uh, days, 220, 230, 240 number of days. But if you again see there is definitely 
some fluctuation here, definitely some fluctuation here, I am again highlighting near some fluctuation here. So, these fluctuations are marked in red. Stability where the dispersion is low, I am marked in yellow. So, this just uh, you can compare the returns uh, for these different um, six indices. And if you see here the max and minimum value for for all of them considered together has gone to about 0.25 here. So, let me use an another highlighter. So, this is about 0.25 and lowest has gone to about in the negative sense about minus 0 0.42, 0 0.42 and about plus 0 0.025 about that. And obviously, there are, are um, high values in this region, low values in this region, which need to be calculated. And, and you see here, there are different colors. So, obviously, um, as the overall international market is very integrated, so obviously, one of fluctuation in negative or positive direction has an effect on the other stock prices or the other indices accordingly. So, obviously, we would be discussing only about uh, scripts, financial assets, but I thought that it may be interesting uh, to also highlight how the data can be utilized. So, this is the Indian rupees to US dollars rate fluctuation rate uh, between 1st January 2016 to 31st March 2016. So, about 3 months. So, obviously, uh, if you see the price fluctuations, I will only highlight the growth happening. And uh, if you see the downward trends, I will mark in, in, uh, in red. So, this is just a, a um, uh, pictorial illustration of the different type of financial data, data which you can utilize uh, for portfolio analysis. Not directly may not be very much relevant uh, to, uh, to portfolio analysis as such what we consider, but maybe somebody wants to formulate a portfolio which has options based on uh, foreign exchange or if somebody wants to uh, utilize a swap to convert an asset to a liability or liability to an asset based on foreign exchange swaps or interest rate based on foreign exchange. So, these type of data or fluctuation of the data would give you some idea that uh, obviously, you are doing the problem, but the, the pictorial analysis of the data would give you some idea, which is uh, may not be available by solving the models as such immediately. So, you are trying to utilize some information from the pictorial analysis with experience and some through the modeling part. So, that is why I have included this graph based which is for the 3 months Indian rupees to US dollars. And if you see the maximum price in that range was about 68.7 or almost, almost, almost about 69 this value almost and the lowest value was about 66. So, I am considering this is almost 66 and this is almost 69. So, if you see the general trend very interestingly, there is an upward trend here, there is a downward trend here. So, obviously, depending on the demand and supply of money which is US dollars in Indian rupees, there has been change in the the exchange rate. Obviously, it does not mean that these Indian rupee and US dollars are only operating in a silo. So, there are effects of inflation, effects of oil prices, effects of gold prices, political atmosphere changes, economic affairs of other countries effect. So, there are innumerable such factors which basically come into the picture in order to determine it. In this uh, subsequent slides, we are going to consider. So, these are again as type of data which I am trying to present. This gives you the foreign reserve for India from 1950 to 1951, uh, starting 1950 to 51, just after independence, till about 
2008-2009. So, they give you the reserves in rupees um, crores. So, in 1950s they were about 1029. So, these are rough estimate values from, from the site which I got from the Niti Aayog. So, I have not given the URLs from where I got the data, but they are actually data which I have taken from net and, and drew this diagrams accordingly. Again, in order to make USF accustomed with type of data which is utilized for different type of financial analysis, need not be only um, portfolio analysis or investments. So, these gives you from 1950, it is about 1229 in rupees crores and obviously, the value of, of rupee is changing. So, the real value nominal values are changing. So, I am not going to consider all these details as such. So, it changes from 1029 falls to 865. So, I am going in the vertical direction year wise. 1029, then it falls to 865, then 881 and goes down to 363. And then again it, it picks up after falling down to a low, quite a low value of 250 in the 1964. So, 1962 63, even though that just I am giving an example, the, the, um, the war with China happened. So, Maybe there was a, maybe there was tremendous pressure on, on trying to um, uh, garner or spend money. Maybe people were, in whatever company companies were there in India, uh, at that point point of time withdrew money. So there it fell to 250. Again, it picked up in 1970s to about 821, and subsequently, if you see the reserves of Indian uh, company uh, as a country is increasing. And generally, if you see in the 1980s, end of 1980s, 1990s, actually the liberalization started. Um, and when uh, Prime Minister P. V. Narasimha Rao along with the Finance Minister um, Dr. Manmohan Singh actually when at things really started picking up, India had to change and liberalize and open its economy. You see there is a huge amount of increase. So, if you consider 1970 to 1990, in this 20 years it increased from 733 to about 6252. So, almost less than 10 times, but almost quite a huge value. And then if starting 1990s, it started picking up and as of now, so in 2008, it is about this value. And obviously, as you know, the reserves of the country is increasing. So, obviously, reserves means mainly in gold and uh, US dollars. So, the, the idea of trying to give you different data, uh, US dollars to Indian rupees, the the values of the returns of five six different indices or the values of the um, um, this foreign reserves so these are the data which we try to utilize in in investment analysis uh, in different ways to understand how portfolio analysis investments can be done accordingly so for finally this is basically a tree map. So, the diagrams which I am giving are different ways of trying to present the data. So, the material may be the same, how you present and how amount of information can be garnered is, is what I am trying to highlight. So, this gives you a tree map for foreign exchange reserves for India again, same data 1952-2009 and each square which you see in this basically gives you the overall proportional amount, the area wise proportional amount which is there in the foreign reserve. So, obviously, initial years it was very low. So, they are in this region, which I am now highlighting in red. And as you go more towards this value, which I am just putting a tick mark in red or the blue color is for 2008-9. Uh, with this, I will uh, 
and uh, the the second class uh, which is the 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 classes which are uh, happening uh, which are going to take place for investment analysis and to to close this lecture i'll just highlight uh, a few important points of efficient markets why i'll come to that later so basically there are few assumptions which may not be true but we'll try to follow that when you go into the efficient market uh, analysis similarly for the capm model similarly for the lacksons model there will be many assumptions theoretically they are true practically they are not but they still give you a good idea that how the overall uh, market overall environment works or functions under the efficient market investors should expect to make a fair return on the investment not more because information is flowing between all the players markets are efficient only if enough investors believe they are not efficient in the sense both positive and negative information should be flowing in such a way that they should even out publicly known investment strategies cannot be expected to generate abnormal returns because if everybody has the same information demand supply stabilizes so obviously nobody can make any extra profit some investors will display impressive performance and obviously that will be compensated Uh, by exact information which will be there for the other players so it's a even playing field professional investor should fare no better in picking securities than on ordinary investors because if information is is complete everybody has and there is infinite number of players so obviously uh, any move being made by an extra set of information by one player immediately percolates and the final one is past performance of is not an indicator what will be the future performance of any script because whatever information was there based on that you are trying to basically work in the market how it will perform obviously the past has no information so basically we consider in some sort of memory loss process if you call it from the word of stochastic processes so as a process obviously is just the term which i use we would not be considering in this course but i thought people who are interested in some quantitative techniques may be interested to know from where the idea comes kya ye sab uska ek ek ghanta hai 